And as I mentioned earlier, we are in Colossians chapter 1 as we continue our study through this letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Colossae. Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at one of the other flagship uh, scripture passages concerning the Lord Jesus found in Colossians 1 beginning at verse 15. We'll look at that together in just a little bit. And in case you're wondering, well, are there any others? I'll say, yeah, there's a third one. And you can jot this one down, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So if you have John chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 1, if you remember that, go back and review those things. And we're going to see this morning three truths about who Jesus is. Some people in the Colossian church had developed a a flawed perspective about Jesus. There were false teachers there who were teaching false doctrine specifically related to the deity of Christ. There were Gnostics there and others who were teaching that Jesus was not God, but that he was one of God's creations or one of God's created beings. We're going to see why is that false teaching this morning and why is that important to us. Kind of like what Lon Solomon would say. So what? What difference does it make? Well, the difference it makes is that what you believe about Jesus will affect your whole life. And there are people in our world today who have a flawed view of Jesus. So let's look at this great passage of scripture this morning. And I want you to see three things in the answer to the question, who is Jesus? We're going to see three things about the Lord Jesus this morning by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read this together, or you follow along as I read. We read here, he is the image, speaking of Jesus here, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Pray with me, would you please? Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture and help us to have a better understanding as we look at these verses together of exactly who you are and impress upon our heart not only those truths of who you are, but the importance of what it means to believe that this is who you are. And you've been this way from the eternity past forever and ever, and this is how you will always will be. Put within our hearts awe over who you are. And may we continue to worship you as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you pick out the first truth there in verse 15? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the supreme God. Jesus is the supreme God. Look back at verse 15 there with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The word image should jump out at you there. It's the word akon, and that's the word that we get the English word icon from. If you've ever been in churches, maybe you've been in churches and you've seen statues or pictures or stained glass windows or whatever of images of Christ. An icon is an image or it is a representation of someone or something. Now, we need to be careful that we don't make these icons, these statues, what we worship. These are representations of who we worship. Uh, Icons can also be called idols, and they can become idols in your life if you're not not, uh, careful about that. But they should point us to the one that we do worship, that we worship Jesus. And here we read in verse 15 that Jesus is the image or the icon or the representation of the invisible God. Now, what does it mean? What's Paul saying here to us when he says that Jesus is the image of God? Well, we do recognize that Jesus is the one that we worship, but Paul is not specifically talking about 
that truth. It is true, but he, that's not what he's referring to in verse 15. Paul is declaring to us by reminding us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that Jesus is the complete and total revelation of God. Jesus is the revelation of God to us. And if you read Hebrews chapter 1, I think somewhere around verse 2 or verse 3, is that the writer to Hebrews reiterates that truth. That's why I kind of think that maybe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I mean, all of these things kind of line up here when we look at uh, John's gospel and then Paul's letter and then the book of, of Hebrews. So when we think about that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, does that mean that God the Father looks like Jesus? Is that what Paul is saying here to us? You know, there are some people that when you say, what's God look like, is that this picture comes to their mind. They picture a, a kindly old man who has long white hair and a long white beard who's sitting in a rocking chair on his front porch just going back and forth, and he's the one who gives out candy and gifts to people. When you say, who is God, that's what people think of. That's what the image is that comes to their mind. Well, let me just go ahead and tell you this morning, God does not have a long beard. God does not have two eyes and two ears and a mouth like Jesus. How do you know that, Mike? Well, look back at, back at verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So we don't know that God has eyes at all. We say, well, it says in the Bible, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth. Yeah, they, they do. God is everywhere, and he's seeing everything that's taking place. God knows what's happening in our world and in our lives today. But here Paul reminds us that you can't see God. God does not occupy a physical body. To put God in a physical body would be to like stick him inside of a physical box. God is not constrained or confined to a physical body. God the Father doesn't physically look like the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus doesn't physically look like God the Father. But what Paul is telling us here this morning is that Jesus speaks and thinks and acts and works exactly like God. Exactly like God. In fact, Jesus told that to his disciples, John chapter 14 Verse 9, as Jesus was speaking to the disciple Philip, he told Philip and the ones who were listening, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So Paul here is declaring what Jesus said, that Jesus is 100% God. When you see Jesus, you see God. The apostle Paul affirmed this truth in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? It's Jesus, the Lord Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Lord Jesus. And the Word, the Lord Jesus, was with God. And the Word, the Lord Jesus, was God. Jesus is 100% God. Paul is, or Paul is affirming that to us. So what does that mean to us? Why is that important to us? Well, if you, wanna, if you wonder what is God like, look at Jesus. If you ever want to know, what's God think about this? Or what does God say? Or what does God want in my life? Look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the complete, total, exact representation or revelation of God. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is fully God in his essence, in his character, in his power, and in all the other physical or spiritual and physical attributes that Jesus is fully God. So we see here, verse 15, that Jesus is the exact revelation or representation of God. But look back here at verse 15, something else we see about him, that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Do you see it there? Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Now, what is Paul telling us there? Well, this part of verse 15 has been a source of controversy for a long time. In fact, if you go back and you look at church history all the way back to the 4th century, there was a man by the name of Arius who lived back in the 300s or the 4th century A.D. Arius began to teach whoever would listen to him that Jesus was not God, but rather that Jesus was a created being. Arius concluded that the firstborn of creation, what we just read there in verse 15, meant 
that Jesus had been created. That Jesus was not exactly like God, but that he was kind of like God. And there's a big difference between being similar to something and being exactly the same as something. And this was the disagreement. In fact, this disagreement became so severe that it led all of the church leaders to gather together at a place called Nicaea. And Nicaea is uh, no longer a city called Nicaea. It's in the country of Turkey. And if you kind of Google Nicaea, you'll find where it is in the country of Turkey today. And all of the church leaders came together and they had a powwow. The powwow was actually called the First Council of Nicaea. They met in 325 A.D. And the church leaders gathered together to decide on the issue of Christ's deity. Is Jesus kind of like God or is Jesus fully God, exactly like God? Well, after a meeting for however long it was, several days or maybe it was even several weeks... The council concluded this, and let me just read what their conclusion was to you. Jesus Christ, they concluded, is the Son of God, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father. He is God of gods. He is light of light, very God of very God. He is begotten, but not made. He is identical to God, the Father, in substance and in essence. What were they saying there? Jesus is 100% God. He's not kind of like God. He's not similar to God. He is God. That was their conclusion. And the other thing they concluded had to do with Arius. They condemned him. They excommunicated him from the church. They burned all of his writings, all of his books, all of his sermons. They deleted all of everything off of his cell phone. Uh, they, they did all of that. And then they exiled him to a place called Illyria. So they did away with Arius. So let's go back to this term firstborn. It still doesn't negate what Paul is saying here, that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. What is he saying here? Well, the term firstborn has nothing to do with being created. The term firstborn is a title. And it's a title that, that uh, communicates to us the idea of power. It's a title that represents honor and authority. That Jesus is the one who occupies the highest position of honor, power, and authority. Now let's think about this back in that day and in that time, back in the Hebrew uh, way of doing things, is that the firstborn son in every Hebrew family was given a double portion of the inheritance. And you can go back and you can read through... Um, all about Israel, Jacob, and how he portioned, portioned out things, and how Reuben as the firstborn didn't get it because he disqualified himself, and how Joseph came along and got the double portion. And you can read all about those kind of things. The firstborn son received a double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn son was also given the honor of being the physical head of the family and being the spiritual leader of the family. That's a position of honor. That's a position of authority and power. And here we read in verse 15 that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. He is firstborn in the sense that Jesus occupies the position of absolute power and honor and authority over what? Over all creation. Paul declares that to us in verse 15. Jesus possesses all honor and power and authority. Why? Because he is God. It all comes back to that basic truth. Jesus is the supreme God. So as the firstborn, he, he is worthy of all power, all honor, all authority. And that's the place where he sits even today, occupying his throne of grace high above us. Now let's go back to that guy Arius. Even though Arius was condemned by the church and his teachings were burned and he was excommunicated and he was exiled and put away, even though all of that happened to Arius, guess what? His teachings live on today. Oh, it's called something different, but the teachings of Arius exist in our world today. Cults and false religions today, there are some who deny that Jesus is God. Well, who would that be? Well, maybe let me mention a few of them to you. Maybe you can say, yeah, I've run into people like that. If you've ever uh, met a Jehovah's Witness, 
If you've ever had the opportunity to talk to someone who is of the Jehovah's, Jehovah Witness faith, they believe that Jesus is not God, but that Jesus was the first thing that God created in creating the heavens and the earth. If you've ever talked to a Mormon, Mormonism is a form of Gnosticism, and they believe that Jesus was not always God, but that Jesus was a good person, and he kind of worked his way up the ladder and eventually became God. And they believe that if you work hard enough, and if you're good enough, you'll be able to climb the ladder and become God yourself one day. That's what they believe. There are Unitarians today who believe that Jesus was created by God, but that Jesus is not God. And then if you ever talk to a Muslim, the uh, religion of Islam believes that Jesus is not God, but rather he's just a great teacher and a good person. If you want to find out, folks, if somebody is representing a cult, you know how to do it? Just ask them this. Tell me, what do you believe about Jesus? Explain to me, who is Jesus? And if, they don't, if that person doesn't come back to you and at least say that Jesus is God, you need to beware of that person and what that person is telling you or trying to get you to believe. Number one, Jesus is the supreme God. Look at verse 16. The second truth we see about Jesus this morning, not only is he the supreme God, but Jesus is also the sovereign creator. Do you see it there? For by him, now don't miss this, all things, that word all is important. You know what the word all means? Yeah, it means all. That's right, it means everything. Don't, don't, don't skip over that. That's important. And we'll come back and talk about that in just a little bit. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Let's see if we can unpack that just a little bit. But in order, before we unpack it, let me just remind you or turn your attention back to the creation account. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1. All the way back, the way the Bible opens is what? In the beginning, God created. What did he create? The heavens and the earth. And if you read through that account, you'll see that in Genesis chapter 1, in the creation story, that all three members of the Godhead were present in the creation account. Listen to this. In the beginning, God, that's the Father, created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, there's the Holy Spirit, hovered over the face of the waters. And then God said, there's the Word. The Word is the Son. The Son of, who's the Son? Jesus. So what do you see in that first two or three verses of Genesis? What do we see there? God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. All present, all all active, all being a part of creation here. And then back in John chapter 1, verse 3. You know, in verse 1 where we say in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. When you jump down to verse 3, John 1, verse 3 says, All things were made through Him. Who's Him? The Word. That's Jesus. Remember the Son. Through Him all things were made. And without Him nothing was made that was made. That's important to remember. Now let's go back and talk about that word all. Paul gives us a definition in verse 16 of the words all things when it comes to creation. Do you see that definition there? All things are those things that are in heaven. Think about that for a little bit. When was the last time you went outside and you looked up? When was the last time you went outside at night and you looked up? And you noticed, boy, there's stars everywhere. Well, there's planets everywhere. Oh, there's the moon. There's, there's a lot when you just look up. And in him, all things were made that are in heaven, that are on earth. And then notice how he expands on this a little further. Visible, invisible, whether they are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. What is Paul saying there? He's telling us that Everything that's physical, everything that's material, whether it's big, whether it's small, whether you can see it or you can't see it, that Jesus made it. 
And then Paul goes on and says something a little bit further. Not only did Jesus make everything that's material or physical, but Jesus also created everything that is institutional. Do you see it there in verse 16? Whether it's thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, Paul is reminding us that Jesus also creates nations, governments, kings, presidents, rulers, political parties, Jesus is responsible for creating how much? All things. It covers everything. So what have we seen so far? Well, number one, Jesus was present on the day of creation. Verse 16, all things were created through him. Let's look at that word through for just a little bit. The word through describes the way that creation took place. All things were created through him. So Paul is telling us here that Jesus was the agent of creation. Creation took place through him. Now, what does that mean? I was trying to think of an example, and I don't know if this is a good example, a perfect example. It probably isn't, but hopefully it'll get the point across here. How many of you have ever built a house before? Have you any of you? Sometimes we say that, well, when I built my house, now think about that. When you say, when I built my house, did you really build your house? No, you didn't. You gave the money to build the house. You maybe drew up the plans or the ideas to build the house, but you didn't build the house. Somebody else built the house. And this is the idea of creation, is that God is the author of creation. Jesus is the agent of creation. Or in other words, Jesus would be the builder. He's the one who created all things. All things were created through him. But look at verse 16. There's another important phrase or word we need to look at. Not only were all things created through him, but all things were created for him. Do you see that there? The word for describes the reason for creation. Through tells us how it was done. For tells us why it was done. All things were created for him. Now, why were all things created for Jesus? Well, think about this. A king has to have a kingdom. If if a king doesn't have a kingdom, he's really not a king. A king must have a kingdom to rule over. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the king of kings. So doesn't it make sense that Jesus being the king of kings would have a huge, wonderful, marvelous, big creation or kingdom to rule over? All things were created for Jesus to rule over as the king of kings. Look at verse 17. Not only is Jesus the maker of all things, but notice something else important about what he is. And he, we read verse 17, is before all things. So even before the heavens and the earth were created, there was God. There was Jesus. And even eternity before that, There was God. There was Jesus. That Jesus is before all things, not only in time, but also in rank. That Jesus is above all things. He is before all things. And look at this. And in him, all things consist. Did you notice that those words, all things, show up a lot in those two verses? Now let's talk about this for just a little bit. Not only is Jesus the creator, but Paul tells us here that Jesus is also the sustainer. He is the sustainer of what? Of all things, right? Are you with me this morning? He is the sustainer of everything. Jesus created everything and he holds everything together. Now, do we see this in creation? Yes, we do. If you've got eyes to see and if if you're open and, and willing to receive it, we see this truth clear in creation. Let me just remind you a little bit about what we see in creation. In our solar system, we have planets. And those planets rotate or travel around the sun, and they don't just get together one day and say, well, which way are you going to go? Now, I'm kind of tired of being this close to the sun. It's hot. I'd like to be a little further away. They, they don't get together and do that. Every one of those planets is in an orbit. And each one of those orbits is exactly what it needs to be, where it needs to be, how it needs to be, so that nothing crashes. Solar systems rotate perfectly in their own orbits within galaxies. Stars, when you look at them, they remain in these precise locations where God has placed them. And then think about this. This is the invisible part. 
In every molecule, do you remember this from science? Every molecule has a nucleus. And around the nucleus are these electrons. And guess what those electrons do? They're going like this. They're spinning around that nucleus. And they're in exactly the place where they need to be. And they're going exactly at the speed they need to go so that one electron doesn't show up at the intersection at the same time that the other electron shows up. And you get a, you get a crash or you get an accident there. All of those things we see in creation. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer there tells us that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Affirming what Paul tells us here, that Jesus holds it all together. Everything exists by him and consists in him. So think about this for just a minute. If Jesus is holding the world together like this, remember that, that, that old song, he's got the whole world in his hands? You know, I didn't really think about that a whole lot, but I'm glad he's got the whole world in his hands. Because just imagine this, if Jesus took his hands off the world for just even that long, what would happen? Everything would come apart. You would fly apart. All the molecules would disintegrate. All the planets would crash. I mean, everything, everything would come apart if Jesus was to take his hands off of creation for just a moment. And one day that's going to happen. One day in the final judgment, Peter tells us this. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's what it's going to look like and sound like and feel like and smell like when Jesus takes his hands off of creation for a moment, destroys what is present, and then remakes a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus is going to do that one day. And I had a professor who said, I'm looking forward to having a seat in the front row to watch him do it. <laughs> that we will be able to watch him make everything over again and make it the way that it's supposed to be perfect and right and wonderful. Jesus is the supreme God. He is the sovereign creator. Look at verse 18. Notice the third truth about Jesus. Jesus is also the superb leader. Verse 18, and he, who is he? Jesus. He is the head of the body. Now, what is this body? The church. He tells us there, verse 18. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, there's that word again, from the dead, that in all things, there's those words again, he may have the preeminence. Now, sometimes we refer to the church as my church. That, that's my church. Uh, those, those are my folks. Uh, those, that's my family. Those are my people. And that's kind of true in the sense of identification. We identify as this is my church. But it's not true when it comes to ownership. This is not my church. This is not your church. I believe that every born-again believer should be a member of a local church. But we do not own the church. We do not run the church. You don't run it. I don't run it. The deacons don't run it. Jesus is the head of the church. He runs the church. The church belongs to him. He bought it. Jesus purchased the church. The price was his own body, his own blood. He purchased it on the cross. And just as your head hopefully thinks for you, and your head decides for you, and your head directs where you go, is that Jesus decides and directs where the church will go. Because the church is his. He is the head of his body. Not only does he direct who is part of this, but also where we go, what we do. He directs the members and the operation of the church. Jesus is the head. We are his body. And so, as his body, we should seek to know what the head thinks. We should seek to do what the head says. We ought to seek to know and follow our head, the Lord Jesus. Whatever he says and whatever he wants. Now... Let's look at verse 18 again. 
Again, he's the head of the church who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. There's that word again. Remember what that word firstborn means? It's a title. It describes a position of honor and power and authority. Jesus was not the first person to be raised from the dead because if you read through your Bible, you see that even back in the Old Testament, there were people that were raised from the dead. But we see, remember, that Jesus was the first person who was raised from the dead who didn't die again. He is the first person to be raised from the dead who didn't die again. And as the firstborn of all creation, Jesus occupies the highest position over all who are raised from the dead. Now, who are the all who are raised from the dead? Well, folks, that's everybody. Everybody one day will be raised from the dead. You're either going to be as a saved person raised from the dead to eternal life, or if you're not saved, you'll be raised from the dead unto eternal judgment or separation from God. Jesus rules supremely over everyone, those who are saved and those who are unsaved. Now, why is that? Well, look at verse 18. Paul simply just describes it this way. In order that he may have the preeminence. The word preeminent means to be number one, to be first, to hold the highest rank, to possess the highest honor and dignity. And since Jesus is God, doesn't it make sense that he would be number one? Doesn't it make sense that he would have all glory and honor and power? Now, God has determined to do this. God has determined that this is the way that it will be. Because it's God's desire to express his love for his son. And God has expressed his love for his son in this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. God has highly exalted the Lord Jesus and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess, what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. As Jesus is exalted, as people fall before him and kneel there and proclaim that, yes, Jesus, you are God, God is glorified. Jesus is exalted and God is glorified. We are his church. And if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you are part of his church he wants you to be a part of a local church where you can come to know him better and to be able to serve him with the gifts that he has given to you, to follow him and to encourage others and to be encouraged by others. You ought to be a member of a local church if you are not. But let's just review real quick. Jesus is what? Number one, he is God. He's the supreme God. Number two, Jesus is what? He is the creator. He is the sovereign creator. And what that word means is that since Jesus made it, he can do whatever he wants with it. He could burn it up if he wants to. He could tear it up. He could throw it away if he wants to. Jesus is the sovereign creator and ruler. And Jesus is, thirdly, the head of the church. As members of his body, we are responsible to trust him, to obey him, to follow him, and to serve him. We are responsible as members of his body. So let me ask you this. What is your perspective of Jesus? How do you view Jesus today? Maybe you'd sit here and think, I believe all those things. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, well, I didn't know that. Or I really wasn't sure about that. Folks, what you believe about Jesus will not and cannot change who Jesus is. What you choose to believe about Jesus will not change Jesus, but what you choose to believe about Jesus will affect your life forever. If you're here today and you're not saved, and you've just listened to what I've had to share with you from God's Word, and you say, oh, that's nice. Uh, that's probably helpful for somebody, but that's just not for me. It still doesn't change the truth that Jesus is God, He's the Creator, He's the head of the church. But if you choose to die in that state, you will be separated from Him forever and ever in a place called hell. But Jesus calls us to trust Him. He calls us 
to follow him. He calls us to believe and to obey because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us are under the wages of sin, which is death. But all of us have been offered the gift of God. God so loved the world that he gave us the Lord Jesus. And whosoever, that's you and me, that's anybody, whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God demonstrated his love for you and his love for me, and that while we were sinners under the wages of sin, that Christ went to the cross and he died there. He took our place and he paid the wages of our sin to the full. And if you'll confess with your mouth this morning that Jesus is your Lord, and if you'll believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he is a living Lord and a risen Savior, the Bible says that in that expression of faith, in that expression of belief, you will be saved. Whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. One day, and we're going to talk about this some Wednesday night, one day Jesus, the head of the church, is going to come back for his church. And that might be today. That might be before we even pray and say amen in a little bit. That might be before you have lunch. It might be before we come back to church this evening. It might not be for another year or longer. But one day, Jesus is coming again. And he's going to come, just as we read a little bit ago, like a thief in the night. Is that for some people, they're going to be very surprised that Jesus showed up. Because they didn't believe he was going to come. Or they're going to be surprised because they weren't expecting him to come right now. Jesus is going to show up and some people are going to say, I thought I had today. I thought I had tomorrow. I was going to take care of that tomorrow. Jesus showed up and there was no tomorrow. Or Jesus called you home because today is the day of salvation. Today is the last day you have to live. And you didn't make that decision. Jesus called you out of this world, and you were lost. You were planning to take care of that tomorrow, but tomorrow never came for you. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation, and now is the time to be saved. And if you're born again, if you're saved, today is the day to trust Jesus with fill in the blank. Today is the day to do what you promised that you were going to do. Today is the day to follow him. Today is the day to obey. Today is the day to trust him. Today is the day to make that decision for him. Don't put it off until later. You'll be disappointed if you do. Make that decision this morning. And that's our invitation today. And so whether you're saved or you're not saved, the Lord puts before us some sort of decision to make in your life. If you're not saved, would you trust Jesus today? Would you be willing to follow him? That might involve you not only confessing him with your mouth, but also walking forward and proclaiming him publicly. Would you be willing to do that? And if you're saved, maybe you've walked away from him, or maybe you're putting off something till later, is that maybe that decision would involve you to surrender right now and maybe to surrender publicly. I don't know what it would be, but I trust that you would know. And we're going to pray that God would give us not only the ability to know, but the courage to do it. So pray with me right now. Would you please, every head bowed here, in every eye closed, no one looking around, and just in the quietness of this moment here, the stillness of this place, let's just be quiet and just listen. Listen carefully to the still, small, sweet voice of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, as He speaks to you and says, this is the way, this is the decision, this is what you would do today. Would you walk in it? Would you believe him? Would you trust him? Would you be obedient? What's God saying to you right now? You know what it is. You may not like it. You may not want to do it. But whatever it is that God would say or call you to is the best. And everything that God calls you to be and to do today is ultimately for your good. And it's it's an expression of his love for you. And it will be for his glory if you would obey and follow and trust him. So if you're not saved, maybe you would just make this little prayer yours. Father, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner but I believe that you are Lord and Savior, and I believe that today you are my Lord and my Savior. 
I choose to trust you. Thank you for dying on the cross and taking my place there. Thank you for shedding your blood to pay for my sins. And I trust you today to save me from my sins and to take me out of that place of unrighteousness and add me to your family. Please do that, Lord. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Make me part of your family and then help me to follow you and trust you and serve you for the rest of my life. Whosoever would trust the Lord Jesus like that shall be saved. And then would you follow the Lord today? You'd say, well, I am saved. Have you followed him? Are you trusting him with, and then fill in the blank, that situation, that person, that relationship, that problem, whatever it would be, are you, are you trusting him with that? Maybe you'd give that to the Lord today and say, Father, I give this to you. Take care of it. Help me not to worry about it. Father, as we bow before you, Lord Jesus, and are reminded that you are God, you are creator, you made this day, you made us, and you created this time for a purpose in our life, and that you are the head of this church. Work in this place, work in the life of every person who's here today, and help us just to remember that you've given us right now, and we take advantage of that. Whatever decision you have placed on our heart, I pray you give each one of us the courage to trust you in it and to follow you this morning. And be honored, Lord, as promises are made, as decisions are made, as promises are kept, as people step out in faith, as we as a church step out in faith, be honored in this place. We know that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So give us faith in order to take a hold of the grace that you extend, which is infinite and free and sufficient for every problem and situation in our lives. And be honored, Father, as we follow you this morning and in the days to come, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.